Welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Here is your host, Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof, a nationally recognized health educator, author of the award-winning book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty, and creator of the Talk Puberty app. And welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof. Today's episode is going to have a guest I've had in a previous episode, and that's Dr. Ryan Fisk, in which Ryan is returning to talk about some more common questions that pertain to most boys, including common questions about things with sperm and wet dreams. So Ryan, thank you so much for returning for today. Thanks for having me. And thanks uh, to all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in. Yes, as you as you heard Ryan say, you can also watch this, you can view it. And that's on my YouTube channel that's titled Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof. So feel free to listen in or to watch in or to watch. <laughs> Before we jump to the questions, Ryan, do you mind reminding us about your background? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so I am a uh, educator for nearly 20 years. Most of my experience is in secondary ed, um, former health and physical education teacher, uh, director of health PE and athletics. I've coached some uh, varsity and JV sports. And uh, now I actually took a turn in my career a couple of years ago um, into technology, into educational technology. And I, uh, I've always been passionate about marrying uh, effective and engaging technology into the health and PE setting. And now I have the opportunity to expand that uh, across all of our content areas for the betterment of our, our students and our education. Well, thank you again for returning to this episode in which we're going to talk about more common questions that children ask that pertain to things like ejaculation and wet dreams. And I know as a former middle school teacher, I was asked a lot about wet dreams, which are also called nocturnal emissions. If we break down that phrase of emissions, that means something coming out, being emitted, and then nocturnal meaning at night. So Ryan, how would you explain to a young person what wet dreams are? So I think the probably the most, most important part, as so many things are happening uh, to our bodies through adolescence and through puberty, and this is in both males and in females, of course, as we know, um, we have to normalize it. You know, there's nothing wrong with nocturnal emissions. This is a part of um, of our bodies, and this is a process of our bodies. So you know, as we talked about uh, in the last episode where we were together, you know, the male um, the male testicles are producing uh, sperm cells in the millions, you know, millions and millions, and it's sort of a constant production. Um, and these nocturnal emissions uh, happen in the same way that a, uh, or in a similar way, I, I would suppose that when a woman um, ovulates and is passing an egg uh, to potentially be fertilized, um, you know, the male um, the male body, the nocturnal emissions are are a byproduct of, you know, there's there's too much, there's too many sperm cells uh, in, and we need to make room for more. So the nocturnals are a way of uh, emitting, as, as uh, Lori, as you said, uh, passing it from the body to make room for, uh, to produce more. And as we know, um, you know, the way sperm cells are produced, they, I believe it's two to three months is basically the life cycle of a sperm cell from um, from production to sort of maturity to when it's ready uh, to fertilize that egg in, you know, if the situation presents itself. Uh, but again, just to go back to the very beginning of the answer, it's, it's important uh, as, as adults, as educators, as parents, uh, as I'm a parent of, of, uh, of uh, two girls, um, it's important to normalize uh, that nocturnal emissions are a part of, um, you know, a part of our bodies. And I always said, to young people that it's like your body is practicing releasing this sperm in which the, the two to three months, that means that's in the scrotum sac, that's in. That's not if the sperm is ejaculated to potentially create a pregnancy, sperm doesn't last that long inside a fem quote, female's reproductive system, but that's two to three months within somebody that has a scrotum sac, correct? Yes. 
So sometimes young people will ask, well, how many sperm can be in one healthy ejaculation? And do you know that number, Dr. Fisk? Yeah, it's um, it's it's quite a large number. Um, we'll say between uh, between two hundred and five hundred million sperm, uh, and and of course there's there's other fluid, uh, that, you know, other things that compose the semen. So the sperm are part of that, um, but two hundred to five hundred million sperm cells as part of that ejaculate. Yeah, and those are teeny teeny tiny, and I have to refer to a health educator who's in the Midwest who had a visual for her high schoolers, she would bring in a um, like a pound container. Like if you think if you go to Costco and you get a pound of, let's say it's peanuts or something. No, it has to be more than a pound. It has to be more like 10 pounds, I guess, in that container. So she would get a 10 pound plastic container and she would go to a beach area and fill it up with sand. And she would put it like on a desk and say, imagine this is one ejaculation to have young people understand that there are millions and millions of sperm that's released. And for somebody that has an egg, you only need one to, to meet with that egg to fertilize it. So that's why when we talk with young people that are potentially of the age they might be sexually active, we want to help teach them how to, if they're going to prevent a pregnancy, how to best do that. Because we only need that one sperm. Right. Right. And I think you know, going back to the previous uh, question we were talking about with the, with the body's practicing, you know, and as we know, the female body in the same way practices and, and sort of readies for that uh, potential fertilization through the process of ovulation, you know, when the egg is released yeah. into the fallopian tube uh, and is awaiting, potentially awaiting uh, for that for that one of 500 million sperm cells to come in and fertilize yeah. it. Yes. So for a young person let's say that they have a wet dream, how can they handle that? And I even wanna back up before you answer that question. I know I sometimes had some students in class that would say that they thought they were urinating at night and urine is different from semen. Urine, if you sniff it, it's gonna smell like urine. And I think most of us, even by the time of 10, 11, 12, we can get a sense of what urine is. So it's gonna have a different smell um, it's also going to be a different color. Usually the color of semen is more of a whitish or a cream color, uh, maybe a little grayish depending upon the individual, but urine is going to have a yellow color. So, so again, I had some students that were thinking they were wetting their beds, but I was like, no, potentially you're having a wet dream. And that's why I always recommend to a parent and other caregiver, talk to your children earlier so your child doesn't think that they're wetting their bed at the age of 12. Right. They're having a wet dream. And I think even also with that, you know, you know, wet dream and wetting the bed in and of itself, you know, we we as 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 parents, as educators, um, we can maybe do a better job of distinguishing what those two things are, because even as I'm hearing it, wet dream, wetting the bed, that sounds kind of nebulous and a little bit fuzzy. But if we say nocturnal emissions and this is it's, it's a different it's not urine, it's semen, it's something else. Um, you know, to, to further distinguish the two things. And I think another point as well, because sometimes it may be hard to pick up the color, um, depending on what color your bed sheets are, but the viscosity is, uh, is going to be different as well. And the other things that compose uh, the semen, in addition to the sperm cells, there's other, there's other fluids and other things that come in that um, are contributed through other parts of the male anatomy. Um, the semen itself is going to be, uh, yes, yes, white, creamy colored, uh, a little bit thicker, and it may be uh, sticky, and it may be sticky into the morning as well. So that could be another telltale sign of, you know, not wetting the bed, but uh, actually having a nocturnal emission instead. And that's what you mean by viscosity. It's that what it contains and the thickness of it. The thickness. Yeah, the thickness. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, so speaking to the viscosity piece, we think about, you know, uh, uh, common household uh, kitchen kitchen uh, occurrences. So we, I think of the urine more as a, as a a cup of water in terms of the viscosity. It's very sort of thin, very liquidy, uh, and then maybe I'd argue that semen uh, takes on the place more of a of a type of a salad dressing, uh, like a Thousand Island a ranch. Maybe not quite as uh, thick or as viscous, um, but definitely something that's a little bit more. Um, I guess, sort of creamy in terms of consistency than water. And that's what I mean by viscosity. 
Now for the amount of a common ejaculate, some people think it's so much, but it's not. It's really between two and five milli milliliters, if I can say it correctly, which is when I look up, one teaspoon is one milliliter. No, wait, I'm sorry. One teaspoon is equal to five milliliters. But it sounds, right. it feels like it's so much more that's ejaculated, correct? Well, yeah, I, I mean, a measured teaspoon, there's, there's, a, there's other things at play too, is that a measured teaspoon may, well, likely differs in size from the teaspoons that you and I have in our kitchens when we're eating soup with. Um, you know, as a, as a, as a way to measure for wet or dry ingredients, a teaspoon is, you know, a teaspoon is a teaspoon. Um, I don't, huh, I don't know about the, the, I, I think that's accurate though. Te a, a measured teaspoon, five milliliters, that, that seems like yeah. the right amount of, of liquid, um, in an ejaculate. And I think that, um, you know, if uh, in the case of a nocturnal emission, when you're looking at your uh, bed sheet the next morning, it is it is possible that perhaps the um, the area may have a spread on the sheet, so it may appear or look like it's a little bit bigger than uh, than it was. But um, you know that that could just be a, a byproduct because semen is wet, so it could be a byproduct of just you know you drop a couple drops of water on your sheet and then and it kind of permeates outward, uh, no different. That's great that you said that in which let's say that a young person wakes up and they realize they had a wet dream. What do they do? How do they handle that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's important to talk to parent or guardian in the house. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, I think it's important to keep an open dialogue in general, um, you know, because oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable for kids it's uncomfortable for parents too. Um, and so to our, to our children and young adults listening, um, uh, whether it's your, whether it's your mother or your father, um, older sibling, somebody else in the household, guardian, someone that you trust, um, someone that you're comfortable talking to, uh, I think it's important to have that conversation. Um, you know, explain what happened, um, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, this is, a, this is a part of our bodies. This is a part of, uh, of growing up and, uh, for better or worse, whether you like it or not, all of us are going to grow up at some point. Um, I feel like I'm still growing up at times, uh, but you know, all of us are going to grow up. We're all going to go through these changes and I, and, you know, nocturnal emissions, as I mentioned a couple questions ago, uh, it's a normal process. We need to normalize it. This is this is something that happens to our bodies. So it's not, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. There's not that's that's not weird. It's not different. Um, it's a part of um, it's a part of our male anatomy. I've said to some young people that they can also say that they're taking more responsibility on if all of a sudden they remove their sheets and they bring mm -hmm. it to the laundry room. It's like, you can say, I'm growing up, you know, I'm getting more responsible yeah. to start working on how to explain that potentially you had a wet dream. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's part of it, just just doing chores and just, you know, uh, adulthood, but it's, you know, we have the changes in anatomy and physiology, but it's it's also um, the changes in, in mental capacity, um, emotional capacity, maturity, um, taking on chores, doing those things. Um, so yes, of course, changing the bed sheets and taking some of those responsibilities on yourself is, is important. Um, but I, I do believe in the, the value, uh, of open dialogue and of conversations, uh, as well. And, you know, that's, that's up to each and every one of you listening to, um, determine if that's your, your game plan, but, um, you know, I can't stress enough. This is a normal part of growing up. Um, it happens to everybody. It's happening to um, you, your friends or for the parents listening, your children's friends. Like this is, you know, everybody's going through these same uh, these same trials and tribulations. Sometimes it happens to some folks sooner. Sometimes it happens to other folks a little bit later. Uh, but eventually we're all going to be going through it. And, you know, according to our genetics, according to our blueprint, according to our plan, um, you know, for, for when this is going to happen, we're all going to go through these changes. So can a person make themselves have a wet dream? Because it's happening in the sleep, I would say no, because, you know, it's an uncontrollable, it's subconscious. Um, 
Let me jump to another question that is very common from young people, especially those that have a penis. And that is how can they handle having a spontaneous erection? So maybe they're in school and they're maybe in physical education class or they're supposed to do a presentation in class. Like how can a young person handle that? So, so first, first and foremost, I'm gonna reiterate this as well. Normal, totally normal. Um, sometimes they could happen uh, for a reason, you know, um, you know, as, as we go through adolescence, sometimes we take an interest in um, other classmates, we look at uh, other people a little bit differently, um, all normal. And uh, sometimes spontaneous erections, that first word spontaneous, what does that mean? Happening without reason, happening randomly. Um, so it can happen for no reason at all. How do we take care of that? Um, you know, sometimes I think, uh, you know, just knowing that it'll go away is an important part of that eventually. Um, you know, if you're, if you're seated at your desk and you're, you know, asked to get up and participate, or if you're participating in physical education class, uh, maybe this goes back to, um, you know, potentially adjusting yourself if you need to, um, for those of us wearing, um, you know, boxer briefs or briefs, um, you know, that could mean, uh, making an adjustment and, um, you know, taking advantage of the support that we have in the briefs, um, uh, even boxers as well, um, but but really also knowing that that it's a it's normal and that uh, the erection will eventually go away. Say if they have one and they have to walk to another classroom or something, is there a way to like hide it? Yeah, I guess um, you know I I don't I don't know what the scientific. Uh, the scientific way to say this is, but you you could certainly uh, tuck the uh, the erect penis if you have a you know again boxer briefs even boxers sometimes there's some elasticity uh, in the waistband so um, you know so that's an option uh, for those wearing briefs you know you have the built-in support of the briefs uh, that would allow you to you know adjust yourself a little bit if you if you need to um, you know better hide it and better conceal it. Also, I know I used to work with Chris Homer at the beginning of my career, and I did a puberty talk with him once and, you know, like the self-management skills, how to handle changes of puberty. And he said that to carry like books over the area or like a sweatshirt or something just to cover the area, if, if you're feeling you need to cover, like as you're walking from one classroom to another or something like that. I mean that sounds that sounds like a good idea too. That's a, that's a great point. That's a good strategy. Well, you mentioned earlier in this episode, as well as in the last episode, that people grow like at their own rates. They're going to have their own sizes. So, how can a person stop comparing themselves to others? Because you are into this technology and you're aware of the social media that goes on and how it can impact how we perceive, how we look at ourselves. So what can a, a person do if they're trying to compare themselves? Yeah, well, I think even if we dissect that that question, you know, um, comparing themselves to others, you know, creates right then and there, if if one person is comparing themselves to another, they they have a perceived reason to make that comparison. Um, you know, that maybe um, I'm less of a man or more of a man or, or you know, uh, this person has more testosterone or less testosterone. Um, what we have to always remember is that we, um, as, as males and females, come in all different uh, shapes and sizes, uh, different heights, different widths, um, and we grow and develop, um, you know, according to, um, you know, really anatomy and physiology and really uh, at the root of all that are genetics, uh, sort of dictate how we're going to, um, develop, um, from childhood to young adulthood to adulthood. So, um, you know, and, in the comparing piece, I, I, you know, unfortunately, I mean, social media has its, you know, some great uses um, in making our entire world feel a little bit smaller and us a little bit more um, together. But at the same time, you know, um, it gives everybody a microphone. 
all of us as as individual private citizens as public figures as everybody in between uh and 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 you know we've we've become our own publicists our own pr experts and sometimes we're not giving the full picture uh you know we're not showing the bad parts of uh, of our lives you know hey i tripped down the stairs this morning how many times do you see somebody post that on social media you know uh it's a lot of good everything good is you know it's it's uh, sometimes it's a distorted um, perspective. You know, we see that also when it comes to magazine ads and TV shows and other things that are that are not social media, um, you know, and certain things that we see and that we read and that we consume um, tends to tell us that this is the way things are normally. Um, so it's important, you know, and I'm not saying I'm not trying to debunk, you know, all the great TV shows and magazines that are out there and say, you know, this is hogwash, throw it out. Um, but just to be just to be critical and just to be understanding that, you know, with every viewpoint, there is an opposing viewpoint. Um, so just to be just to be mindful of, uh, you know, of what's normal. And and what we're talking about today is science. We're talking about the um, development of the human body. We're talking about uh, puberty. We're talking about the anatomy and physiology and the changes that occur uh, more particularly for this episode in males. Um, but this is this is science driven. This is, you know, so it's, um, I don't think we should be comparing ourselves as, uh, as boys and young men uh, to one another, because that's, that's quite simply, that's not how the, that's not how it works. I know I've often talked to young people about how to analyze those influences, which is a national and a New York state standard for health education, but to note that there's Photoshopping. Mm. And then sometimes the media chooses one type of person to use as a model or for commercial. And we need to step aside from that stuff because I love how you keep on saying everybody's different. Like we have to embrace what our body is, you know, how it grows. Yet when you see something in the media that has a certain shape, or I'll even go to sometimes there'll be a man on TV and he's, like in a commercial for perfume or cologne, and it shows a bare chest, not even body hair on the chest, you know, any chest hair. And does that mean then that a young person has to remove their chest hair? Like, how do they handle those questions? And that even goes back to, you know, and, and facial hair and grooming. And we talked about in the last episode, you know, uh, you know, part of the changes that occur with puberty is the development of hair, um, face, underarms, genitals, um, and, uh, you know, and we all have individual choices as to how we, you know, care to groom ourselves. Do I want to grow a mustache, a beard? Do I want to keep all of my facial hair? Do I want to shave some of it? Um, you know, and the same can be said about chest hair as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I do want to say, I think the media has gotten better to their credit with the models. And I do see that for, um, certain brands of clothing and certain products that, um, you know, I think um, in response to some societal pushback that there's been more inclusivity, um, people of different colors, of different sizes, um, you know, being included and being uh, a part of these advertisements. Um, so, you know, customers that may uh, look or identify that way can can relate to the product a little bit better. Um, but then I think we do need to be doing a lot better job with, you know, with some of our, some of the TV shows, some of the reality shows, some of the things that are out there, because uh, even to to your point about the cologne ad with the bare chest, um, you know, whether or not the chest hair is shaven, you know, I think there's a, an over sexualization sometimes of products that may, you know, cologne is not a sexual product by nature perhaps, right? So, you know, and, and sometimes we saw this back in the day with alcohol ads and uh, and other things where you're you're sort of embedding, um, you're embedding, you know, males and females together in a way that's very provocative for a product that in and of itself is not provocative. So you're seeing those two things in the same frame and now you're you're making this this sort of um, association and does it does it help to sell the product? Maybe, but you know this is why we need to be informed consumers and really to be able to dissect an advertisement, to be able to dissect a TV show. Um, and of course, we can enjoy these things, you know, and and we can look at them and we can enjoy them and we can appreciate what's out there. But um, to be an informed consumer and understand that you know 
what they're selling is this, um, but what we're seeing is that. Um, you know, we can draw our own conclusions based on on um, you know what we know. Ryan, Dr. Fisk, I thank you again for being here today and answering these questions and reminding people to be who they are, accept their body, because that has definitely been a major theme between this episode and the previous one. So I thank you so much for being here today. And would you like to share again how people can get in contact with you if they choose to? Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to echo um, Dr. Reichel's sentiments. Thank you for um, thank you all for tuning in, for watching, for those of you that are on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me for anything, I'm on Twitter at Ryan underscore Fisk. That's R-Y-A-N, the little underscore and last name F-I-S-K. Or you can get me on my website at www.fiskfisk.nyc. And that Ryan underscore Fisk at where? That's a tw that's on my Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Oh, okay. Somebody okay. actually has the at Ryan Fisk Twitter. Um, okay. So I had to add an underscore to mine to distinguish myself. You know, you can't have okay. two two people can't have the two people can't have the same email address. Two people can't have the same Twitter handle either. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being here and for your time. And for our listeners, feel free to connect with Dr. Fisk. Feel free to connect with me at thepubertyprof at gmail.com or pubertyprof.com. Remember, if you want to know about more questions that children commonly ask about puberty and other growing up changes, check out my book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty. It's won some awards and also check out the Talk Puberty app, which is a great way to have discussions with young people about most common questions that children ask about what most girls experience and then what, what most boys experience. So feel free to check those out. And I thank you so much for listening in. I hope you have a happy and healthy day. Thank you for listening to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Did you enjoy this episode? Please like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the Puberty Prof on Twitter or Instagram. The Puberty Prof, Lori Reichel, wants to hear from you. Go to pubertyprof.com or click on the link in this episode's description. There you can find more information, as well as ask questions to be answered by the Puberty Prof in a future episode. That's pubertyprof.com. Also, remember to check out the Talk Puberty app and the book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty. Until next time, this is the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics.